right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Cross Canada virtual road trip. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I will be your host for today. I am from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and all month long, all school year long, we are broadcasting out live science, exploration, adventure, and conservation events for classrooms across Canada, across North America. So today I am live. We're going to have Mallory join us shortly from Parks Canada, and they are going to take us on a little adventure. But before we do that, I want to talk about our partners for the Cross Canada Virtual Road Trip. It is presented by Canadian Geographic as well as Parks Canada. So do take some time today uh, after the event and visit uh, our website. So if you visit the website, you can find uh, all of the events that are coming up there, exploringbytheseat.com backslash road trip. We've already had two events on our road trip so far. That means we have eight events to go as we travel coast to coast to coast across Canada, visiting national parks, historic sites, marine sites. It is just an absolute blast. So do check out the events that are coming up. Check out the recordings of the past events. And of course, join us uh, for more events. Coming up now, we have, as I mentioned, the Fortress of Louisburg joining us. We are taking a trip to Nova Scotia. It is a treasure trove for archaeologists. There are hundreds of artifacts in the ground. Every single one of them can tell us things about what life was like in the 18th century. But we're going to learn today that there is a problem and we might lose many of those artifacts before they're even discovered. So I'm going to bring Mallory in live with us right now. Here she comes. Hey, Mallory, how are we doing today? Hi, Joe. I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Thanks so much for joining us in Lewisburg. Amazing. Well, Mallory, we have an incredible group of classrooms joining us. We've got some camera classrooms we're going to meet shortly, but I do want to do a few quick shout outs. Uh, we've got classrooms saying hi in the chat from Lethbridge, Alberta, from Mississauga, from Brantford, uh, Sayward, British Columbia, Kitchener, Ontario, Calgary, Alberta, Guelph, Ontario. And we've got a class in Alaska hanging out with us. Estevan, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. So keep saying hi in the chat. We'll keep doing shout outs. But Mallory, I would love for you to take over for a little bit and take us uh, into the park, take us into the site. Sure, that sounds great. So hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Mallory, and I'm an archaeologist with Parks Canada. So today we're going to be talking about archaeology, what it is, and what it can tell us about the past and how we can use archaeology to help us deal with problems like coastal erosion. So, Joe, I don't know if you want to share my slides on the screen here. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So I'm joining you today from the Fortress of Lewisburg National Historic Site, which is on the southern shore of Cape Breton Island. Cape Breton is called Unamagi by the Mi'kmaq and has been their home since time immemorial. The ocean that surrounds the island has been a rich food source that has supported Mi'kmaq in this place for generations. But the power of the ocean has meant that the coastline here is constantly changing. So the ocean and the rich fishing grounds off the coast also attracted European settlers to this area. Europeans were particularly interested in fishing cod, a large species of fish that thrived in great numbers in the waters near Cape Breton and Newfoundland. In fact, Lewisburg was first established by French settlers in 1713 as a place to fish cod to be shipped back to Europe. Once they were here, French settlers realized that Lewisburg would be a good place to establish a permanent settlement and military base. So why Lewisburg in particular? Here, the harbor is large, deep, and protected, good for anchoring ships. And unlike many harbors in the north, Lewisburg's harbor doesn't freeze in the winter, so you can come and go at any time of year. 
The harbor was also easy to protect from attack by other European powers. And to protect the town and harbor, French officials began building fortifications around Louisburg in 1719. I've highlighted them here in green. The settlement was many years. It was ultimately captured by the British and then destroyed in the 1760s. After Louisburg was destroyed, it was never rebuilt as a military base although people continued to live in the area for the next 200 years. So in this picture, you're looking out from inside the ruins of the fortress, and in the background, you can see a museum that was built on the site in the 1930s. Now, if you come visit the fortress today, it'll look very different. You'll be able to see part of the fortress that was rebuilt in the 1960s. But when Lewisburg was at its height in the 1750s, it was a busy colonial port. And we estimate that around 4,000 people lived in Lewisburg year round at that time. And it wasn't just home to fishermen, soldiers, and military officers though. Many others lived in Lewisburg, including tavern owners and craftspeople. Lewisburg also had a large bakery and many gardens. Merchants and their families also lived at Lewisburg and many business owners were women. There was also a large hospital and a school for girls. Now, all of the people who lived at Lewisburg through the years left behind traces that we can see in the archeological record, even after the fortress was destroyed. And as an archeologist, my job is to look for these traces to understand how people lived in the past, Archaeologists look for all kinds of evidence of past people. And often we do this by digging up the places where people once lived. We call these places archaeological sites. And when we dig up a site, which we call an excavation, we often find objects that were left behind. And we call these objects artifacts. So now I'm gonna move over to the artifact table and I'd like to show you some art objects that we found here at Lewisburg. Um, as you'll see, all kinds of different objects can become artifacts and we often find items that were left behind because they were broken or accidentally lost. So while I'm getting set up here, I'd like you all to think about something that you've left behind that might become an artifact someday. All right, <clears throat> so I'm just going to step over here to the artifact table and I'm going to show you some things that we found at Lewisburg. Now you'll notice as I'm doing this that there are some objects that might be somewhat familiar to you that might look like things that you still use today and other objects might be a little bit different. So I want to start with one of those different objects here. Can anyone guess what this might be? So you'll see that there's a little lip around the side here. It's made of copper. Now, if you guessed a lid, you would be correct. This is actually a lid that was used for a hot chocolate pot. So at this time, just like today, we really enjoy hot chocolate. Hot chocolate was a special treat that was enjoyed in Lewisburg. Um, chocolate at this time was very expensive and this Special, a special drink that was prepared. Um, it was not something that people had every day, but it was something that they very much enjoyed. And we find lots of these at Lewisburg. Now, a chocolate pot uh, at, in the 1700s, and then you'd add your milk or water to turn it into hot chocolate. And then you'd open this little hatch in the top of the pot and stick in your wooden stir stick, and you'd froth it all up to make hot chocolate. So we prepare it a bit different today, but it's a drink that we enjoy now that was also enjoyed then. 
We find lots of other objects that are related to food consumption. Obviously, people had to eat. Um, and here's another object that might look a little bit familiar to you. This is a, a fork from the 1700s. And you'll see here, the handle of this fork is made with bone. And the body of the fork here is made of metal. And the reason why it's brown like this is because it's rusted. It has two tines instead of the four tines we usually see on forks today. And the other thing about um, eating and using forks at this time period that's a little bit different is that you wouldn't have used the fork to bring it up to your mouth with a piece of food on it. Instead, forks were generally used to hold food down on the plate while you were cutting it with your knife. And then when you would cut off a piece, you'd use your knife to bring it up to your mouth to eat it. So that's what a fork would have looked like back then. So we also find a number of other objects that relate to kind of the life of individual people and, and personal grooming. So this is another object that might look familiar to you. Um, this is a comb and it's also made of bone. And one thing you'll notice about this comb is that the tines on the, on the comb, the little teeth are spaced really closely together. So the reason for this was that people in the 1700s struggled a lot with parasites of different kinds. And they often struggled with lice and other kinds of parasites that would attack, attack your head and your scalp and bite you. And that could be very uncomfortable. And people at this time, just like people today, cared about looking good and being well-groomed and being well-dressed. And so making sure that you could comb your hair very well was something that helped people feel comfortable. So having a comb like this would have been a key part of your personal grooming routine. So here's another object. And this is gonna be probably pretty different from what we see today. So another thing to know about the 1700s is that there were no indoor toilets. There were no flush toilets like we see today. So if you had to use the washroom, you would have to go out back to the outhouse. But if you had to go in the middle of the night, what would you do? So to solve that problem, people at this time kept what they called chamber pots. So this would be like a little portable toilet that you could keep with you in your room. And if you had to use the washroom in the night, you could go. And then the next day, you would empty this outside. Um, so this is very common. We find lots of these on site as well. So the last few objects I want to show you relate to the military at Lewisburg. So as I mentioned, Lewisburg was a military base primarily and a fishing port um, and a shipping port. Um, but we find lots of objects that are related to the military at Lewisburg. And here's one of them. So this is a sword. And you can see here that the handle of the sword inside here has been made of wood. And then it's been wrapped with this brass wire. You'll also see the blade of the sword here, but it looks a little strange because it's uh, rusted away from being in the soil for so long. And it's shiny now because it's been cleaned up by our conservation team but it would originally have been much longer. So people in the 1700s sometimes fought with swords, but more often they used muskets and other kinds of artillery like cannons. So we find lots of musket balls on site at Lewisburg as well. And here are a couple examples. These are a little bit like modern bullets. They would have been used the same way um, in a gun. Um, and these two are slightly different sizes because they would have been used in different muskets. And we can actually tell if a musket was an English musket or a French musket based on the size of the musket ball that we find. All right, so I'm going to come back to the PowerPoint here and switch my camera again. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully you can see me again.
so now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about coastal erosion, and then I'll talk about one of the sites we've been able to save. And as I mentioned earlier, coastlines constantly change. This is a totally normal thing, but we have a problem, and that's the history of the Fortress of Lewisburg is such an important part of the story of Canada that we want to preserve it, and we want to do that so we can keep teaching about it and learning from the archaeological record. Um, but our problem is that the fortress is sitting right on the coast. And since the 1700s, the sea level has actually risen about 80 centimeters. So here is the high tide level in the 1700s. And you can see the archaeologist here in the coat is holding on to an iron ring. And that's where sailors would have tied up their boats at the dock in the 1700s. And here's the high tide level today. So you can really see how much the sea has risen. And this change has meant that low-lying areas around Lewisburg are in danger of being washed away. The good news is that there are lots of different ways that we can protect the coastline. And we've used a few different techniques here at Lewisburg. So one thing we've done is that we've built these groins that stretch out into the harbor. And these groins are long stone walls that trap sand and sediment that's swirling around in the water and cause it to build up. And trapping all this sand builds back the beach that was once there. In other areas, we've actually brought in sand to help fill in sandbars that pretend red here out in the ocean is actually called a barrier beach. And it works just as you would expect from the name. It's like a barrier that protects the coastline behind it from eroding away. Every stretch of coastline is a bit different though. And we have to use different methods to protect different areas. Some areas we just can't prevent from washing away. But if we know there are archeological sites in areas that will wash away, then I can come in and excavate the sites before they disappear. So I wanna tell you about what we've learned from one site that we've been excavating out on Rochford Point. And you can see Rochford Point here on the map on the right. It's sticking out into the har harbor. <clears throat> and because it's such a narrow piece of land and it's in between the harbor and the open ocean, Every time a storm comes in, massive waves hit the point, and these waves are causing it to erode quickly. So let's look at how Rochford Point has changed over the years. In this picture, we've put a map from the 1700s on top of a current map. And here in yellow, I've traced where the coast was in the 1700s. And now here in red, I've traced where the coast is today. So you can see how much smaller the point is today than it is in the 1700s. And as it erodes, we keep losing more and more land. We know that lots of different things were happening out on Rochford Point in the 1700s. So we know from the written record that fishermen built wharves and homes out on Rochford Point and dried their catch along the beach. And later on, larger homes and gardens were built on the point, including homes owned by the Carreau and St. Marie families. We also know that Rockford Point was used as a cemetery. So here I've highlighted in blue where the cemetery is marked on the map between the Carreau and St. Marie properties. And here in purple, you can see the large Carreau family home with its associated outbuildings and gardens. And then the smaller St. Marie property is here in green, although it has very long gardens that uh, border the cemetery on one side. So even though we have maps and documents that tell us what was happening on Rochester Point, we still don't know exactly where many of these buildings once stood. And before Rochester Point erodes away, we need to answer some questions. We need to figure out more about what life was like for people who lived on the point. We want to know where the houses were, where the cemetery was, and more importantly, we need to move the people who were buried in the cemetery so they can stay protected. 
So to try to answer those questions, we've been working on a rescue archeology span dig at Rochford Point since 2017. We've teamed up with another archeologist from the University of New Brunswick, Dr. Amy Scott, who's here in the middle in the blue sweatshirt. And she's been running the excavation as a field school to train future archeologists. She's called a bioarchaeologist, which means that she specializes in excavating and studying human remains. And once the people have been excavated, they'll be moved and reburied in a nearby a protected place out of danger of continued erosion. So while we've been out excavating the cemetery site, we've also come across what's left of one of the homes on Rochard Point that I mentioned before, the Carroll family home. So on the left here is a picture of one of our excavations at the Carraro. And you can see here, I've highlighted in yellow that we've uncovered the hearth and the fireplace of this home. This would have kind of been the center of the house. It would have heated the house and it would have been where all the people would have done their cooking here. You can also see some other things. So here I've highlighted in purple that we've uncovered the burned floor of the Carraro house. Now it's black like that because it was burned and it was burned in place when the house was demolished. So we found lots of clues while we're excavating that lead us to believe that the Carraro house may have looked like this white house that you see on the picture on the right when it was still standing. So I'm going to go back over to the artifact table and show you a few more artifacts that we found at Carraro. But in the meantime, while I'm getting the camera switched, I want you to think about what questions you have about what life was like in the past. Okay, so that camera should be ready to go if you are ready to switch. Awesome, thank you. So I'm just gonna move camera over here to look at some artifacts. <clears throat> so I showed you before the picture of the excavation where we saw the hearth and burned floorboards. And we also found lots of this artifact here on site. This is a very small piece of glass. It's very flat. It's kind of greenish in color and it's very thin. So this is window glass actually. So this is one of the clues that, um, one of the things that we find that is a clue as to how the house was constructed. And this tells us the Carrero property itself had glass windows, which would have been something expensive for families of this time to have. But we find frequently at Lewisburg that the homes had glass windows. Aside from the building itself, we find lots of artifacts that point to what daily life was like. So for example, there's this green piece of ceramic, it's kind of soft, kind of coarse. Um, and when we find a piece of ceramic like this, we try to figure out what it what it came from. So to do that, we look at all kinds of things about the piece. So we'll look at the any engravings it has in it, its shape, its size, its thickness. And if we're lucky with enough research, we can figure out what this piece once belonged to. And in our case here, we're fortunate at Lewisburg to have lots of examples of similar objects so that we can tell what it might've been. So here we have, <clears throat> this is a green um, slipware bowl that probably would have been used for food preparation. And if you look at this little piece that we found on Carraro, you can see that it probably was part of a rim of another bowl that was about this size. So bowls like this would have been produced in France and then shipped over to Lewisburg across the ocean. Um, and then they would have been used in food preparation um, and and serving. And one of the neat things you can see about this dish is that it actually has on the inside some black lines, which would have been where somebody would have scraped the inside of this bowl with a spoon while they were preparing their food. So you can think about 
somebody making a cake today and having to scrape out the inside of the bowl and how common that everyday action is and think about how that used to be done in the past as well. So the next object that we found here at the Carrero family home is this little piece of gray ceramic with this blue paint on the front here. It's actually a glaze. Um, and this little piece would have come from Germany and would have been shipped over here. And we, again, look at the decoration, the size, the shape, and we can figure out, well, this piece probably came from an object like this. So this is a mug, quite a large mug. And we find pieces like this on the site quite frequently. And you got here in the bottom, this, this piece from the Carrero family home probably came from a mug like this. So every time we find a piece of ceramic on the site, we take it back to the lab and we clean it and we catalog it and we assign it a number. So you can see here on the inside of this mug, every little piece that was collected was given a number. And then what we try to do is reassemble it. And that gives us a sense of how much of the object is there and then also what the object would have been. So this kind of a mug produced in standard sizes um, so you could order a mug that would have held a liter, for example, which is how much this mug would have held. And each standard size was marked with a number that you can see here. Sometimes we find pieces that can tell us a little bit about what the economic status of a family was, how well to do they were. And, and here's an example of one of those pieces. So here's a little tiny piece of porcelain. And porcelain, you can almost see, if I compare this with another ceramic shirt here, do you see how fine and smooth the porcelain is? It's a very high quality material and it would have been very expensive in this time period. So when we find a piece of porcelain like this, we know that this family could afford porcelain and it was an expensive thing. So this family was probably fairly well to do. And you can see all kinds of decoration here on the surface. And we suspect that this piece of porcelain may have come from an object like this. So porcelain was produced in China and exported to Lewisburg. It's very finely decorated. This probably would have been a teacup, but it could also have been used for drinking hot chocolate. And you can see that one of the things about this porcelain that makes it so fine is that it's been decorated with gold. So this gold gilding would have been applied after it was fired. Um, and it was a very expensive form of decoration. So finally, I've just brought out a bag from the collection of various objects that we found at Rochford Point, just to show you the variety of sizes and shapes and colors and pieces of ceramic and glass that we find on the site. And each one of these little pieces connects us to a particular place connects us to a particular kind of dish, a kind of food people were preparing. Um, so together, all of these pieces help us to build the story of what was happening out on Rochford Point. So I'm just going to come back to one final right here. I'm going to switch my camera. Okay, great. Looks like we're back. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, so as we work out on Rochford Point, however, this work enables us to learn so much about the lives of the people who lived at the fortress, to save their stories, and to share them with all of you. So I really hope that you enjoyed this presentation and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions. So please share them. Thank you. All right, Mallory, thank you for sharing such a great uh, presentation with us and taking us into not only the history uh, of the area and the amazing finds, but the race to, to protect them before uh, we lose them to the ocean. And it's, you know, just one more story about how, how climate change is having impacts, not only in Canada, but all 
uh, around the world. And we don't want to lose that important part of uh, Canada's history. All right, we're going to turn things over to the classrooms now. If you're on YouTube, send your classrooms in via the chat and we'll work some of those questions in. We're also going to start working in some of our live camera classrooms and we'll get some of their questions. So I want to start off. We're going to go to Miss Lawson's crew in Lethbridge, Alberta. So let's bring them in now. There they are. Hey, Alberta, how are we doing today? Hello. We have a question for you. Grayson, do you want to come ask it, please, right here? Hello. Do you like your job? I love my job. It's such a special thing to be able to do. And actually talking with you guys is one of my favorite parts of the job. All right, very cool. That was a quick question. Do you guys want to pop another one in? Do you have another one handy? Uh, we're just working on a second one if you want to come back to us. Of course, we'll come back. All right, let's bring in another crew here. I think this time we'll go to Miss Emily's third and fourth grade class. They are joining us from Cochrane, Ontario. So let's bring them in now. There they are. Hey, three, four, how are we? Good. Hello. Bryson, Bryson, Hello. 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 Where are those doors? Hello. Where are the swords made? Where are the swords made? That's a great question. Um, most swords we find here at Lewisburg would have been made in France and they would have been shipped over like many other objects here. So you could have had repairs made to swords here or um, and there was blacksmithing that happened here in North America, but most of the fine work needed to make swords was happening in Europe at this time. All right, great question from Miss Emily's third, fourth. We're gonna come back for another one soon. Uh, I'm gonna dip into YouTube because there's so many questions coming in <clears throat> via YouTube and I wanna see, uh, this one's kind of fun. Miss Nagel's class is tuning in with us and uh, Devonshi would like to know, what's the strangest thing you've ever found? Maybe a mystery or something unusual. Strangest thing. Um, I'm not going to say, I, I actually can, I can share an object with you, actually. It's not, um, it's not strange, but it is unusual. So one of the things that we have here um, in the Northeast is that we have really acidic soil. And because the soil is so acidic, it means many times things don't preserve very well. So, um, but we're very lucky here at Lewisburg because we have some objects that are quite rare that otherwise wouldn't have preserved. Um, um, I can share my document camera again and show you one of those objects that I've pulled here. Yeah, that sounds great. And one of the things that we don't usually get um, are textiles. So I'm just going to come over to the table here one more time. And I've pulled this object from the collections. This is a sock. So I'm just making a little space. So here you can see that we have it mounted on a form that looks like a foot and that's to keep it from deforming because it's very fragile. But this is a fairly complete sock from the 1800 or 18th century. And um, it's very unusual to find an object like this especially in the Northeast, because as I said, things tend to decay very rapidly. So um, one of the neat things you can see about this sock is that it's actually been mended, probably by its former owner. So here you can see the stitching on the heel where the heel wore through and somebody stitched it up. Rather than make a whole new sock, they wanted to use what they had. So this is a very unusual object um, that we don't often get to find. So it's very cool to be able to see this here at Lewisburg and share this with you. All right, that's very cool. A sock from the past. I hope it's not a stinky one. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't smell anymore. <laughs> that's good, that's good. 
Uh, I'm going to grab one more question from YouTube and then we're going to go back uh, to a couple more camera classrooms. Mr. Uh, LeBron's class is tuning in with us and Diego would really like to know, can you give us an estimate on how many artifacts have been found at Louisburg and where do you keep them? Where do you keep all the uh, artifacts? So that's a great question. There, um, we estimate that the collection has over three and a half million objects. So uh, that number is only growing every year as we do more excavations. Um, but the objects are all held here in this building where I am today. And in fact, behind me, you can see some of these wheeling storage units. Um, these are full of artifacts and our library. Uh, but they're all stored here at the Fortress of Lewisburg. All right, let's go back to a camera classroom this time. We're going to go to Miss Mustard's class this time. They are joining us. Let me double check. There we go. From Ontario, some fourth graders. Here they come. Hey, Miss Mustard's class. How are we doing? Good. How are you? We're here from Brandon. All right, we have a question from Shania. Where are most things in Louisburg expensive? So what was the most expensive artifact you found or what you think would be the most expensive? Ooh, that's a tricky one. I'm trying to think what was the most expensive. Well, we do find um, items of personal adornment, like jewelry, we'll find rings, um, we find coins. Um, so objects that are made from precious materials like gold probably are the most expensive and would have been the most expensive at the time as well. Um, and we occasionally find objects like that. It's not as common as you would think. All right. Great question. We're going to swing back for another one shortly because I think you mentioned in the chat you've got a couple. We're going to go to Second Street now. We've got another classroom hanging out with us. There they are. Uh, grade five six is hanging out with it. Mr. Falconer. Let's bring them in. Hey, five six, how are we doing today? Good. All right. Um, how do you know where to find the artifacts? How do we know where we find the artifacts? Yeah. Now, how do you know where to look? That's a really good question. And how to look, yeah, how to know where to look. Um, <clears throat> so we do our work in stages. And the first stage of any project is to look at the documents and the historic record and to see what those can tell us about any particular piece of land that we're interested in. Um, and then the second step is once we have kind of an idea of what happened historic record, we'll go out to the piece of land and we'll just walk back and forth across it. And when we're walking, we'll look down at the ground and see if we can see any signs that people were there. So any kind of disturbance in the soil, so any kind of mound or depression, we'll look and see if we can see any little pieces of artifacts popping up, which happens pretty frequently. Um, and once we've done that walking survey is what we call it, so just walking back and forth, then we can start to pick out, okay, this might be a good spot for us to put in one of our excavation units. So this might be a good spot to dig. So, and that way we kind of narrow it down. And every kind of site is different too. So on a site like Lewisburg, we might look for certain signs, but if we were working on say a site from many thousands of years ago, we'd look for some different signs. It all depends on kind of what you're looking for. Okay, well, there's some very popular questions on YouTube. Several classrooms are asking about this question. They're wondering about currency or money. Does that ever turn up? And then they're also wondering about books, any books that have survived uh, that long, or is the paper just doesn't preserve well? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the question about currency. And I have to say that archaeologists love finding coins. And can you guess why we love finding coins so much? I'll give you, I'll just tell you, it's because coins have dates on them usually. 
So when we find a coin that has a date on it in a particular site, that tells us that that site can't have happened later than that date. Okay, so that helps us understand when things are happening in the archaeological record and it helps us know what time period that dates happen. So there are variations to that. Of course, sometimes people keep things for a long period of time and they get lost later. So it's complicated, but we do find lots of coins at Lewisburg. Um, and when we collect them, we store them here with the other metal objects in the collections. Um, and the second question was books. Yes, books. Thank you. So the paper objects here. And that is, again, because the, um, the soil is so acidic. But there are lots of um, records that have been kept in France that relate to Louisbourg. Um, when the French knew that they were going to be attacked by the English, what they did was they loaded up all of their records relating to Louisbourg on ships and sent them back to France which is great for us because we have all of these excellent archival records that relate to Lewisburg's history and those have been saved. So we don't tend to see paper in the archival record, but paper has been saved in archives and libraries in Europe for a long time. So that's where we find most of the books that relate to Lewisburg. All right, let's grab another question here from YouTube and then we'll swing by our camera classrooms. Um, oh, I like this question, this is an interesting one. Miss Ms. Griffin's class is tuning in with us and they're wondering, it was a long time ago, so what would they do to store food? Obviously there weren't refrigerators back then. Yeah, storing food was a big problem at this time and people were finding lots of different ways to do it. And actually the desire to have fresh food and fresh vegetables was really high at this time, fresh vegetables were considered a delicacy. So that's why at Lewisburg, we see so many homes that have these huge gardens. And that's because if you wanted something, you would have to grow it yourself usually. Um, but to store food in this time period, people came up with lots of ingenious ways. So burying something in a root cellar, for example, was one thing that we see at Lewisburg a lot for pre preserving root vegetables like potatoes and carrots and turnips. And actually out on Rochford Point, when we excavated at the St. Marie property, inside the house foundation in the bottom, we found the remains of one of these root cellars and it basically looked like a big sandbox. So what you would do is in the basement of your house, you dig a pit and fill it with clean sand, put vegetables in the sand and pack it in and it would stay cold, almost like a modern refrigerator because it was down in the cellar. So that was one way that people kept their vegetables from spoiling. And other kinds of food like meat, for example, you'd have to preserve it in some way. So by salting meat and they'd store it in barrels full of salt um, and that would help preserve it. So, so many great questions coming in from YouTube today. Uh, we're not oh, going to get to all. I think you're muted. But uh, don't you fear, because I have popped up a Padlet. So, if you visit the Padlet, you can see it there, Padlet.com. Uh, backslash uh, our initials, EBTSOYP, backslash rescue. So you can put some questions onto that Padlet and I can share it later with Mallory uh, and the team. And then they'll be able to answer some of those questions because so many great questions, so many students across Canada today, we're just not going to get to all of them. So visit the Padlet. I will share the link uh, in the YouTube chat right now as well. So it's there uh, and can be copied. So there we go. Let's get some of those extra questions there. We're going to take a couple more camera classroom pictures uh, before or questions before we wrap up today. So this is Lawson's crew. If you guys have a follow up, we're ready. I know you were preparing one. We do. We have a follow up. Here she Excellent. comes. How long does it take to find an artifact? How long does it take to find an artifact? 
how long does it take? Well, usually when we're out working, we'll work during the summer when the weather is the best for digging. So sometimes we find artifacts right away and other times we have a while while we're digging through the soil. But generally most of our field excavations last a couple weeks. Um, so it really on the kind of site that it is. Sometimes we find a lot right away and sometimes it takes us almost all season before we find anything. I think I see someone waiting in Mrs. Emily's class for a question. Hey, bud, how you doing? Go ahead. When were artifacts found back then in like, the past? When were these artifacts found? Sorry, I just want I'm to make sorry, sure. Where were the artifacts found? When, yeah. How long have you been looking for them? How long have we been looking for these artifacts? Sorry. Yes, yeah. yeah, that was our question. Sorry, Emily, I think there's a small delay uh, with the signal, but they're, they're curious about how, you know, how long have artifacts been found at this site? So, you know, when were they found? How long have you been looking for them? Oh, okay. Yes. Well, uh, excavations have been happening at the fortress for over 40 years now. So when the fortress was um, reconstructed, like I mentioned before, in the 1960s, when they rebuilt all of the buildings of the fortress, um, <clears throat> At that time, they knew it was an archaeological site, and so they had to start excavating before they could build the new buildings, the recreated buildings. So it was in the 1960s when people first started digging the archaeological sites around here, and we've been doing it ever since. So some of these objects from the ones that I showed you today are actually have been dug up in the 1960s. All right. Miss Mustard's grade four, as I see some faces waiting. Who's got a question for us? What, what is, is the oldest thing, thing you found? found? So what is the oldest artifact you've ever found? Um, well, I found artifacts not here at Lewisburg, but on other sites that are Mi'kmaq artifacts that are many thousands of years old. So probably the oldest artifact I've ever found is about 4,000 years old. Um, but here at Lewisburg, most of the objects that relate to when the Europeans lived here and had the fortress here. So they're only a few hundred years old. All right, and we're going to take another trip to Second Street, five sixes, and see if they have a final question for us. Um, what, is, what is the biggest artifact that you have ever found? What is the biggest the artifact? Biggest artifact. What's the largest piece you found? Oh my gosh! Well, here at Lewisburg, um, we have. We have lots of artifacts that are very large and that makes it hard to store them and carry them and it's a big challenge. Um, and among those very large facts, we have cannons that weigh many thousands of pounds and we also have ink that are very large and very heavy. Um, and so we have to care for those artifacts just like all the other artifacts that we have that are a lot smaller. So we need special storage. Yes, we can find things that are very, very large and very heavy. All right, amazing, that's so cool. So one last question, we'll take one question from YouTube uh, before we wrap up for today. Uh, I'm gonna actually squeeze two because there's two kind of interesting ones. So uh, Miss Thomas Class is wondering the hot chocolate, you, you know, we saw that artifact at the beginning. Was that something for everybody or at the time was it an adult drink, kind of like coffee? 
And then we also have a question about children's toys. Do those turn up? Yes, I'm so excited because I uh, actually pulled some toys to show you all. So I will switch to the document camera again and show you some um, toys that we have. It just takes a moment. Okay, so here we are back at the artifact table. And I'm just gonna clean up the sock. Okay, so you know, people at Lewisburg, there were there were kids at Lewisburg just like there are kids around today, and they had to entertain themselves, and even adults entertain themselves here, especially in the winter months, which could be quite long and harsh. Um, so we find lots of little things that point to what life was like for kids at this time. So this, for example, is a jack. It's made of pewter, and I don't know if if people today play jacks all that often, but it would have been a game you would have played on the ground and you would have bounced a ball and picked up as many jacks as you could um, in that time period and you would have competed with your friends. So we we found objects like this, for example. Uh, we also know that other kinds of games were really popular. So this, for example, um, is a game counter from a board game. Now, it could have come from checkers, for example. There are a couple different versions of checkers that were played at this time. So we find gaming pieces like this uh, often at the site. And finally, um, I also have brought out a die to share with you. I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but you can see the little holes drilled. In, uh, so dice games are really popular with kids and adults. So we find we find a fair number of, of gaming pieces and small pieces like this. Um, we also find small toys like toy boats, um, like a toy um, tableware, like cups and saucers and that kind of thing. Um, that point to, you know, that kids were playing back then, just like today. So I'm going to switch back to my camera now. And, and then I'll talk a little bit about your hot chocolate question. So hot chocolate actually at the time was thought to have medicinal qualities. So um, it probably would have been a drink that was mostly served to adults. And in fact, there are records that um, like French sailors who were being asked to go diving for a sunken treasure some, that happened somewhere else here in, in Canada, um, they were served hot chocolate and meat to keep them warm because it was believed that hot chocolate would keep you warm and healthy. So um, it was definitely a drink that was probably mostly served to adults, but that was also, also thought at this time to have certain kind of healing or medicinal qualities. All right, very cool. Well, I wanna start off um, with a huge shout out uh, to our camera classrooms, to our uh, live classrooms joining us uh, via YouTube and sending in those amazing questions. So on behalf of Parks Canada, Canadian Geographic, and of course us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, thank you so much for being with us live today. If you do want to check out when the next event is coming up live, I'll put the uh, link back up on the screen. You can visit the website here uh, and find all the events that are coming up, find recordings of uh, the past events, uh, and then tune into the new ones uh, that are coming up next. Of course, we'd love to see your classrooms. We also have French events. So uh, each of the 10 places that we're visiting the following day, or sometimes the very same day, we have uh, a matching event in French. And so tomorrow we'll make our way back uh, for another visit, but this time en Francais. 
But coming up next on the English side, we are going to head to the far north and learn about Raptors in the far north on the 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern. So definitely be with us and check that out. I also want to remind all the classrooms that if you do have follow-up questions, you can visit the Padlet right here. Uh, it's posted in the chat as well. You should be able to find it. Uh, of course, we'd love to see what is on your mind and what we might not have made it to. And then there's an amazing contest going on uh, with Canadian Geographic Education. So if you visit here, you can find out how to get your classroom involved. I'll share this link in the chat as well, and I'll share it with all the educators after today's live event. Mallory, and I know Veronique was helping out behind the scenes. Thank you so much for taking us uh, on this trip to the past, but also the future and how we're trying to protect uh, these amazing artifacts. There's Veronique. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was just a great experience. Well, thank you so much for having us. We are so thrilled to be here and we're really looking forward to hearing your extra questions. And so we'll get back to you on those as soon as we can. So thanks for coming. All right. We'll have a great rest of the week classrooms. Hopefully we see you in more events throughout April, May, and even into June. So Thanks so much for now, and we are going to sign off for today.